Oh, Father, you are so good, so good, Lord. And there is only one name. And we want to say it, Lord. Jesus is that name, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, for your provisions, Lord, and for your grace and mercy. As we receive your grace and mercy, Lord, let us not forget to show it to others, Lord. So would you lead us in your word, Lord, especially this first service with Prophecy Update, Lord. Would you explain what it is that may be confusing to us, Lord, so that we would understand. Lord, and may we be bereaved and dig into your word, your oh-so-true, faithful foundation, Lord, that you have given to us, Lord, to check and see. We thank you for this time again, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus we pray. Name. Amen. Amen and amen and good morning and welcome. You can be seated. Thank you. Those of you joining us online, we're so glad that you are. We're going to get right to it for reasons that I think you'll understand shortly. We have two services on Sunday morning, the first of which, of course, is the prophecy update that we do weekly and have for years. And then Second service is now the sermon. It's a verse by verse study through the Word of God. We're currently in the amazing book of Revelation. Our text today will be chapter 1 verses 15 through 18. And what we're going to do is look at how John's vision of who Jesus is to us has powerful implications concerning what Jesus does for us. And that's going to be live stream for those of you online at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time. Um, also, those of you that are watching by way of YouTube and Facebook today in particular, <laughs> well, really every week, but you might want to go directly to jdfarag.org, the website for the uncensored and uninterrupted entirety of today's update. So with that Let's get to it. Much to get to. What I want to talk with you about today is this recent strange and sudden change in people's personality and behavior. And in so doing, I want for us to focus in on what Bible prophecy has to say about this strange change in humans, specifically as it relates to vulnerability, volatility, docility, and conformity. I also want to talk with you about the proof that we now have of the neurological evidence that comports with biblical prophecy in this regard. Now please know the impetus for a prophecy update like this is that we're already even now beginning to see this come to pass. That which was foretold will happen in and during the seven year tribulation. So if we're already seeing this strange change in people prophesied in Scripture now, then it would stand to reason that we must be much closer to the pre-tribulation rapture now. While we're already seeing the beginning of many prophecies that will ultimately find their final fulfillment in and during the seven year tribulation, this one in particular stands out. Stay with me. Here's why. In concert with the other prophecies, we're already beginning to see come to pass. This one in particular is more noticeable for a number of reasons. And one of the main reasons is that it's becoming more prevalent and pronounced in our 
everyday lives with people that we interact with on a daily basis. Do you know what I'm talking about? All right. You still with me? It's too early to not still be with me. We've got a long ways to go. So Now, if you're anything like I am, and I suspect that many of you are, this strange change in people has been baffling at best and terrifying at worst. What if I told you that thankfully we now have this aforementioned neurological explanation for the source of what's actually causing this strange and sudden change in certain people. For me personally, this has been, well, first and foremost, a huge answer to prayer. But it's been so eye-opening and freeing in the sense that heretofore this weird behavior has been inexplicable to me. I could not understand for the life of me how it is that people that I knew so very well had changed so very much. And it was inexplicable, and might I add, very troubling, so much so that I had to take it to the throne and petition the throne and inquire of the Lord, Lord, what is going on? And God, as He's always so faithful to, answered and hearkened unto the voice of my cry, because this is a big deal. I mean, we're talking about friendships and relationships with fellow pastors and brothers and sisters in Christ that have never been the same again, due to this sudden, strange change. And you know what's interesting? Once again, secular science and medical research, particularly in the area of the human brain, which is, by the way, what makes us human, has found that which Bible prophecy has already told us. I say interesting because you hear about this research, researchers have found you know, and they spent a hundred jillion dollars on this research to find. Here's their findings. You ready for it? Wait for it. Laughter is medicinal. How much did you spend on that research? It's right here. Get your own material. That's called plagiarism. You could just go to the Proverbs, and you could have saved all that research time. Oh, but no, but that's how these guys make a living. And so they'll come up with anything just so they get research money. That's another topic for another time. So <laughs> there's another component to this, and I, I, I guess maybe I'll just insert it parenthetically here. I think it's appropriate, because much of what I'm going to share with you today does not come from Christian sources. And the reason for that is because there are no Christian sources that are doing this. So it leaves guys like me having to resort to a secular source in order to find that which the Christian pastor should have already found. And this is why it is, by the way, and this is, again, probably as good of a time as any, and I won't belabor the point, but um, many times I'll quote these sources. We provide links to these sources, many of which are not Christian sources. And again, the reason for that is because I can't find any. If you can find me someone that has this, please send it to the office email through the website. I would be most grateful to you. 
as far as I'm concerned, in the research that I do, which by the way is quite in depth many times, just to prepare for one prophecy update from front to finish requires at minimum four days out of a seven day week. So I would be most grateful if you could provide me with those sources. That would, first of all, it would save me a lot of time. But secondly, it would help me because right now I have to, and this is an indictment on pastors who should know better, but don't as God is my witness, and God knows my heart, if I had a Christian source to quote, I would quote that Christian source, but I don't. So once again, I'm forced to, and by the way, God will use anything or anyone. I mean, if He's going to use a donkey to speak through, <laughs> he can speak through somebody who's not even a believer. How many times in the Old Testament, even the New Testament, has God spoken through a non-believer or a Gentile to God's people? You know it's bad when God's got to use a secular humanist to get through to you. I'm going to leave it at that, because that one was really kind of mean a little bit. <laughs> so I mean, researchers have just found what the Bible already tells us. So they're a little bit late to the party, but at least they came to the party. Now they need to come to Christ. But they have now found out how people will change and are changing they change and act very strange, which is exactly what the Bible says people will do in and during the seven year tribulation. And again, we're already starting to see it now. All right. That was my introduction. We okay? I'd like to start with four prophecies in the book of Revelation, and then three additional related prophecies, all of which describe and prophesy said strange, sudden change. Let's start with Revelation 13. Now this is a very well known prophecy about the mark of the beast, but what I want to do is draw your attention to just verse 14. I know the screen says verse 15. Don't, don't look at that. Just verse 14. I was going to include verse 15. I decided not to. Verse 14 is enough. It says it all. Listen to this. Because of the signs He was given power to do on behalf of the first bee, beast, He deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Hang on to that. Revelation 16, the first two verses. John writing by the Holy Spirit, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went, and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and those who worshiped his image. Revelation 18, 23. We have a, as many of you know, a very specific prophecy about the fall of Babylon, which we've talked about in prior updates, specifically concerning the meaning of this particular word in the original language of the Greek New Testament. So let's read Revelation 18, 23. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. 
for your merchants were, watch this, great men of the earth. Now some people call them the globalists, the elite. I call them demon-possessed conspirators. I prefer that. These are the controllers, as one called them, the demon-possessed conspirators. These are the big players that pull the strings, the great men of the earth. For by your, and here's that word sorcery, which in the original language of the Greek New Testament is pharmakeia, from which we get our English word pharmacy, pharmaceutical, pharma, which in that time was used as a poison potion mixed together in witchcraft and sorcery, in the occult, to enter into and listen very carefully, an altered state of consciousness. You, these are mind-altering pharmaceuticals. By your pharmaceuticals, mind-altering pharmaceuticals, all the nations were, and here's that word again, deceived. Deceived. In Revelation 9, 6, we have a chilling prophecy about people in the seven year tribulation that have been deceived, having received the mark of the beast, who want to die, but can't. The prophecy reads, Revelation 9, 6, in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Second Thessalonians 2, again a prophecy we've talked about in many prior updates. I'll begin reading in verse 9. A couple of things I want to point out here through verse 12. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Now, Zechariah chapter 14, I want to preface this one because I'm not dogmatic about this, but I took a second look at this uh, particular prophecy, and I, it's like the Lord kind of opened it up to me, and I'm now looking at it through a different lens for a couple of reasons. So let me read the prophecy first, and then I'll try to expound on why it might apply. Verse 12, Zechariah 14. This is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Listen to this graphic description. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Sorry if you already had breakfast. <laughs> But it was verse 13 that caught my attention. On that day men will be stricken, because the Lord will strike, stricken by the Lord with great panic. Each man will seize the hand of another, and they will attack each other. Wait. See, I always thought that this was a prophecy that was describing the effects of a nuclear attack, because 
basically that's kind of what happens. I mean, again, I'll, I'll try not to be too graphic, but I mean, everything just kind of melts here. But the problem with that, some even think it's a solar event, as we have described in the book of Revelation, which would comport with prophecy. I mean, it is just, when we get to chapters 6 through chapter 19, we are going, we are going to go through the seven year tribulation in the book of Revelation only, virtually, from chapter 6 through 19. It is unthinkable, the horror when God's judgment is poured out, the wrath of God on a Christ-rejecting world. And so this would comport with that, but what I can't quite reconcile is where in verse 13 we're told that on that day men will be stricken by the Lord with great panic, and they will attack each other. Wait, how do they know? Because they don't have any eyeballs left and their flesh is rotting, and their tongues have rotted in, in their mouths. I mean, that's TMI right there, right? But so, in other words, they, they, they didn't die. They're still alive. They would have to be if they're going to start attacking each other, because dead men don't attack other people, and neither do the dead uh, panic. Are we okay with that? Is that too, is that deeply profound, or is that just overly simple? Okay, lastly, Matthew 24, again another prophecy, most familiar by many. But I want to read from verse 21 through verse 25. And this is Jesus speaking as He answers the disciples what really is a threefold question about what will be the signs of the end of the age? of your return. And Jesus answers, and of course He begins by saying, let no man deceive you, for many will come in My name. But He goes on in verse 21 and says, for there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh, flesh would be saved or survive. But for the elect's sake, speaking of Israel, those days will be shortened, thank God. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets, and dare I add false teachers, will rise and show great signs and wonders. Why? To deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Jesus in Matthew 13, and chapter 14, verse 29, I forget what verse in 13, says the same thing two different ways. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens you'll believe that I am. I'm going to tell you what, what, what the world's going to be like before the world is like, what I'm going to tell you it's going to be like. So when you see the world be like what I told you it was going to be like, then you will know that <laughs> I am the great I am. Okay. The common denominator with these prophecies is that they speak to what happens to people during the tribulation, and again is even now being seen as we get closer to the tribulation. And it's important to understand that at the core of this strange change is none other than deception, which is arguably the number one sign of the end. Would you agree with me? And maybe there's somebody in your life that 
you've been praying for. Maybe they know the Lord, but they're, they're so blinded to the truth. They've been so deceived, so duped. And it's a great struggle to you because you love and care for them, but you cannot wrap your mind around how it is that they could be so deceived. Jesus just told us the answer. The reason why is because the number one sign of the time of the end is, in a word, deception. It's going to be powerful, a powerful delusion and strong deception. In other words, by the time the seven year tribulation starts, subsequent to the pre-tribulation rapture, thank God for that, people will have already started to display this strange change. And doesn't that make sense? The closer you get to something that ultimately is fulfilled in the seven year tribulation, it will become more evident prior to so great is this very strange sudden change vis-a-vis -vis this powerful delusion and strong deception that unless God intervenes and shortens those days, no human flesh is going to survive. And I believe it's for this reason that we're already even now starting to see the final brush strokes of this prophetic picture painted on the canvas of the horrific, and I mean horrific, seven year tribulation. I'll say it one more time. The reason is that the closer we get to the tribulation, the more prophecies we'll see beginning to happen right before the tribulation. And we are. We are. Among the prophecies that we're now seeing on the eve of the pre-tribulation rapture and subsequent seven year tribulation is this strange and sudden change. People have been and are now beginning to display behavior like that of those described in the prophecies we just read. We may very well be witnessing what I'll affectionately refer to as a pre-rapture, not pre-tribulation, pre-rapture, a pre-rapture zombie-like behavior on the part of those people whose personalities have drastically changed. Now, please know, as soon as I said zombie, come on. See, what you don't know is, see, you're, you're looking at me, but I'm looking at you too, you know. <laughs> I see the look on your faces. In fact, I sometimes watch for the body language, and I won't look at anybody when I say this, but I, I already know what you're thinking, because I can read your mind. Did he just say zombie? Oh, yes, I just said zombie. Wow, he's completely lost it. Can you just hear me out? You know that the master deceiver, the father of lies, the author of confusion, right now in this church service, and even online, does not want you to hear what the Lord has impressed upon my heart to share with you, and He will do everything and stop at nothing to distract you. Or worse yet, Satan will attempt to get you to dismiss this. Why? By virtue of the fact that Hollywood's demonic and predictive programming has been in full force for decades. And one need look no further than to wildly popular satanic productions like The Walking Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Zombieland, 
attack of the zombies. You want me to go on? I don't want to go on. I am keenly aware that as soon as I employ the word zombie, one is prone to just tune out under the banner of this being just merely fiction. <laughs> That's not real. Wait a minute. If you think that, I say this in love, congratulations. You've been brainwashed. And in love, I would implore you to wash your brain with the water of God's Word. This is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't be brainwashed, conformed by the world. Wash your brain with the Word and be renewed. Renew your mind and be transformed, not conformed to the world, transformed by the Word, washed by the water of the Word of God. You've been brainwashed. Should we bow our heads, close our eyes, if you want to leave right now? This would be, we won't look. We'll try, you know. We might peek. Oh, wow, they left. I, I was like that. Okay, fine. I'll take one for the team here. I was fully persuaded that all of these zombie movies and TV series and, oh, by the way, games? I think one of the most popular uh, video games is a zombie game, where you kill zombies before they kill you, which is the problem, because zombies can't die. So have fun with that game. So I, but I, I fell prey to this because I had allowed myself to just dismiss this under the banner of, oh, this is just Hollywood, or better said, Hellywood. So this is where the Lord, as He's so gentle and faithful and gracious and merciful to do, just took me by the hand and said, J.D., sit down, boy, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to revisit this and look at this through a biblical lens. And that's what I want to do. Let's start with a definition of what a zombie actually is. And to do that, we'll look at the Merriam-Webster definition, which is as follows, 1a a willless and speechless human held to have died and been supernaturally reanimated. Revelation 13, died yet was alive, reanimated, not resurrected. Big difference. 1b, the supernatural power that according to voodoo belief, may enter into and reanimate a dead body. The body's dead, but it's been reanimated by a demonic spirit. This is a zombie. 2a, a person held to resemble the so-called walking dead to be a person markedly strange in appearance or behavior. I was talking with Pastor Mac Thursday night. He mentioned to me that there are videos that you can go online and uh, they, basically you can already see walking zombies. Uh, these are people that have taken a drug that has, it makes them, first of all, you see all the sores on their flesh, Revelation. They're just reanimated, walking dead people, and they're still alive. And they're hideous, and they're terrifying and horrifying. As I spent some time praying and researching the reality of zombies, specific to prophecies, I had to make a, a sort of a, uh, there was a paradigm shift that had to be 
which wasn't easy, by the way. Again, I'm just being open with you uh, personally in my own struggle, because you, you've got to get from fiction to fact, you know, from the world to the Word. Okay, so does the Bible talk about zombies? Yes, it does. I just read four of, actually more, of the prophecies that describe zombies during the seven year tribulation. So it's not an easy do, right? Depends on how you're wired, your temperament, your personality, how strong-willed you are. I know you know nothing of what I speak of. <laughs> Stubborn, I think is a word. Obstinate. There's other words too. We'll stop at that. So, but you've got to get from, oh, that's just fiction. That's just Hollywood. That's just, that's not real, to, wait a minute, that is real. So I spent some time researching, and I tried to connect the prophetic dots, as it were, to specific prophecies in the Bible about zombies being present in the seven year tribulation. And I happened to con upon a couple of websites, and I just took some excerpts from them, which, I, which helped me a lot. I hope it's helpful to you. I'm quoting now. Zombies are an interesting construct. They are humans without humanity. Their combination of no soul, no empathy, and violent intent, Zechariah 14, make them guiltless target practice for human survivors. Zombies are considered to be part of the undead, not alive. Now that one was new to me. I think I shared this prior. There's a word going around now, I guess, you know, um, no surprise. Uh, they were uh, unalived. I'll never forget the first time I heard that word. Wait, wait, wait. What? They were unalived. You mean they were murdered? Yeah, they were unalive. We say unalive now. Okay. So they're undead, but yet they're not alive. But they're not dead because they're undead, but they're not alive either. That was not helpful, was it, that last part, probably. All right. If you'll kindly allow me to, I would like to expound on this and again connect the prophetic dots to the cause of this and why we may have to pre-rapture start getting used to this. Before we do, let me hasten to say that I know this can be unsettling, to say the least. I get it. I get that. However, the good news is that there is still hope because of Jesus, the great physician, the God who heals, and the God who saves. So with that, let's go ahead at this time and we'll end the live stream and the, uh, on YouTube and Facebook.